the first time you do a recruitment pitch, it's like the first time you do anything. The chances are it's rather awkward. You know, it's kind of nerve wracking because it's going to become very apparent as to who you really are, that you're really a CIA spy, an officer, and that you are trying to convince the other person to commit treason, to commit a crime. In fact, usually it can be a deadly crime. It can be in some countries they hang people for doing things like that. In fact, a lot of countries they do. So, but I launched into it and my uh, target, he looked at me and he says, Jim, he says, you and I are friends and I'd like to help you, but what you're proposing, that's morally wrong. Now I've pitched Danny maybe 50 or 60 people in my career. He's the only person, only person who ever posed a moral objection. People usually pose an objection of fear. Well, they hang people in country in my country for doing things like that. Yeah, they do. Uh, I had one guy I pitched, and he said, well, no, not right now, but you know my son's three years old. In 15 years, he'll be university age, and I might need you then. Well, I made a note of that. And 15 years later, the agency came to me and said, your friend said this way back when. Do you think he meant it? I said, yes. And so we'd taken that rain check. He, asked, he actually said, well, you, can I take a rain check on this? I mean, literally, the offer that I was making him. And I said, yes. He, so we cashed that rain check in 15 years later. To go back to when my first pitch that was a failure, the guy turns me down. He says, no, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, morally wrong. So I go away from this dinner. My first recruitment pitch has just gone down the tubes. But we have a saying in the CIA that it's okay to get turned down, but not to get turned in. So if he complained to his boss in this other foreign embassy, and by the way, his boss was the ambassador because he was the number two in the embassy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very senior officer. And I could just imagine if he tells his boss, his boss will come storming into our embassy and into our ambassador's office and pound on the table and say, this is an outrage that young Mr. James Lawler, third secretary, has just propositioned my deputy to be a, become a traitor, to commit treason. This is outrageous. And then I was thinking, and what's Washington going to say? Yeah, they approved it, but, ah, but it must be, must be Lawler that screwed it up, you know, somehow. Everybody's going to, I'm going to be left hanging here. So that was, that was what I was thinking about for two or three days. And finally, I thought, well, let me call him and just test his feelings towards me, take his temperature. So I called. And I was relieved that he didn't hang up in my ear. And all I said was, you know, I really enjoyed our dinner last week. I was thinking maybe if you were free this Friday, we could have another, another dinner. And to my great relief, he said, Jim, you know, I was just thinking that too. That would be very nice. So I go to the second dinner with him, with my only goal being to smooth the waters. If there's any feathers that have been ruffled, to smooth it. You know, if he brought it up, I'd say, well, you know, let's not even think about that. You know, we're still friends. We're done. Let's, not, let's not get into this. That was what I was prepared to do. Instead, I get to the restaurant. The waiter goes away after leaving the menus. First thing out of my friend's mouth is, Jim, that offer you made me last week. Is that still good? And I said, well, yeah, of course it is. So I made it because we're friends. He said, well, what you don't know was that uh, a few days after our dinner, my wife announced that she wants a divorce. And I can't afford to pay her the alimony to which she's entitled and put my two high school age boys into private schools. I can't afford to do all that unless I accept your offer. And he said, I know it's morally wrong. And I started to say something about that. And then I said, no. You know, the, one of the things you learn in law school is if the judge rules in your favor, shut up, get out of court. And so I just took it and he proceeded to become a very, very good spy. In fact, he started bringing me out stacks of classified material. I mean, sometimes inches of it. And the first time he did that is he was handing it to me. Now, this is highly classified material from his embassy to me. And he said, what I haven't told you 
is that I hate my boss. Our ambassador is a real son of a bitch. He goes around taking credit for everything I do and everything everybody else in the embassy does. So when I hand you this material, it's like I'm kicking that son of a bitch in the face. And I took the material and I said, we're buddies. Go get some more and let's kick him again. (laughs) So revenge, because you ask yourself, normal people, unless they're a complete sociopath or completely narcissistic, normal people aren't going to do this unless they feel like they've been betrayed first. If they feel like their government, or in this case the boss, has betrayed them, then they're just evening score. The Jesuits even call it covert compensation. You're Mm -hmm. compensating. And so I'm not the traitor. They are. They betrayed me first. That's how they deal with it psychologically. And he was an amazing asset. Um, We had to uh, put him through a polygraph test. That's some of you may have heard it called a lie detector test. It's more of a stress detector test. Uh, It really, there's little validity that it actually proves that you're lying or telling the truth. But it does measure if you are reacting to some questions. And so we would go in a counterintelligence, a strict counterintelligence polygraph test. We try and make it pretty black and white uh, to make the questions yes or no, absolutely yes or absolutely no. For instance, uh, have you told anyone about your secret relationship with CIA? That's an easy yes or no. Did anybody direct you to volunteer to us? Meaning that second meeting. That's an easy yes or no. And thirdly, um, are you working with any intelligence service other than the, than the CIA? Very easy to answer. And the uh, polygrapher, the operator, is not supposed to ask questions that are not already rehearsed with the ops officer, me. They're not to go off on fishing expeditions or anything like that. As luck would have it, I had a very (laughs) naive young operator who'd never even been overseas before. Lord knows how many foreigners he'd even met. First question out of his mouth, he goes, well, I'm just curious, but why are you doing this? And I thought, oh my gosh, let's not get into the morality of this or anything like that, because I could just see my new asset, my newly recruited asset, becoming suddenly having an epiphany and storming out of the room. No. He laughed and he said, because I think this is going to be a lot of fun. (laughs) He was a spy wannabe. And boy, did he help us out. It was later estimated when he went back to his home country and he would provide not only their negotiating positions, but all their fallback positions, everything. For instance, the last time you bought a car, wouldn't you like to know the bottom dollar that the dealer would take? Or if you bought a house? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And otherwise, they would walk away and laugh at you. Right. Yeah. You'd love to know that figure. Well, that's what we got. And it was estimated that it saved the United States, and this was very national security related, billions of dollars. So this wasn't just getting it for the grins. It, Mm -hmm. It saved the country billions of dollars because of that. So I learned that, you know, that usually motivations to commit espionage are multiple. There's never, hardly ever a single motivation. And it's never about money per se. It's always money. In this case, he was, uh, he needed money for his children to put them in private schools. He uh, did it also because he was now in a, uh, literally a psychological hurricane, Uh, you know, If you go through a divorce, you are just psychologically adrift. And if somebody like me is in your orbit and you've got access to classified information and I want it, I'll become your best friend. And so I became his best friend. Is what you're saying, the people that you would try to recruit or pitch, for example, somebody you had been building and maintaining a friendship with for years? Not necessarily years, sometimes only weeks or months. But in one case, it was 11 years. Right. Wow. Because for the first 11 years, I didn't see any uh, apparent vulnerabilities or stresses. He and mm. I became extremely close. So the friendship was real. Oh, well, absolutely. The friendship absolutely. was real. Yeah. I won't say that the friendship was real in all of my recruitments, but in this one, it was absolutely okay. real. In okay. fact, we still refer to each other as brother. And I, uh, he moved away from uh, his first posting to a second foreign posting 
And in the meantime, while he was abroad, while he was serving abroad for his country, <clears throat> the government changed. And not only did the government change, but the ethnic group, which controlled the government and dominated the majority, it was a minority dominating a, a, a majority, it flip-flopped. And so suddenly he was upset that he could no longer be promoted in spite of whatever he did. He said, there's a glass ceiling. I could work my rear end off, you know, forever, and I'm not going to be promoted. And this is, and he wrote to me and he said, Jim, how can I give loyalty to a government that treats its citizens like that? Well, that's like a big sign saying, recruit me. This was 11 years later. Oh, he'd also gone through a divorce. In fact, headquarters nicknamed me Dr. Divorce there for a while because divorce is such a tumultuous period psychologically and financially. Uh, our son went through a divorce. I mean, he was devastated. And you're very vulnerable during that time. Well, his wife, had they'd had a baby. She moved back to her home country. And so when it was coming up on their child's third birthday, I knew he was going to be back in her home country. And I said, you know, I think I have an idea of something that might appeal to you work-wise. Why don't I meet you there? I have to have a trip to Europe anyways. I'll meet you in this country. He said, fine. So this is 11 years after I've met him. We've got an extremely close relationship. So I, what we call breaking cover, I told him who I really worked for, told him how much I appreciated the fact that he'd protected me, even if he'd suspected that. That took 30 seconds. And he said to me, he said, now I have something to believe in. And so he joined my team. He didn't feel like he was betraying anything. He felt like his government had betrayed him. Mm. And so he was on my team now. Worked for us for a number of years. And today he's a successful businessman in his country. And a few years ago he said, Jim, I'm half tempted to put a picture of you up in our business with the caption that says, our founder. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but he's, he's really, no, he's a great guy. I love the guy like a brother. I mean, I'm not, I'm not making that up. Right. He's, he's like a brother.